still a challenge for them to think of it as being something legitimate because um, in their understanding of marriage, it is uh, uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. Um, and some of you may, may feel that way, and I, I want to honor that. But I also want to have some conversation about it as well before we move on. So uh, from a biblical perspective, oops. Um, the text that um, we so often look to when we think about uh, the biblical uh, basis for the institution of marriage is the text from uh, Genesis chapter 2. In just a little biblical background, uh, there are in the Bible two creation stories. I would refer to them as creation myths, not to say that there is no truth in either one of them, but to say that they are part of uh, the mythology of the ancient world. Every culture had its creation stories, its creation myths, and there's truth in all of those myths, uh, but we're not, we should not understand them as being historical or factual in the scientific sense. So this is the second of the two creation stories or myths. Uh, this story is the one that begins with God creating Adam, man. Uh, the word Adam, Adam, is just the Hebrew word for man, uh, for human. Uh, creating Adam out of the dust of the earth and placing Adam in the uh, garden where uh, Adam was going to care for the garden. Um, but God uh, discovers that Adam uh, needs a companion in this whole uh, enterprise. And so God makes uh, a decision to, uh, first of all, uh, potentially have the animals be companions to Adam. And Adam names each of the animals. But it's discovered that, uh, that the animals are not sufficient uh, companions to Adam. And so we get to this text here. Um, and so is there somebody who would read this two slides? Somebody read the, read the, both of them for <coughs> us? I'll, I'll change it when we get there. Who would like to read this? Sure. <clears throat> Jerry. Then the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last his bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So um, oftentimes those who um, are strong proponents of marriage as only between uh, man and woman would quote from this particular passage, which is pretty clear. A man leaves his father and mother, clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. Um, from our perspective of you know, thinking more broadly, biblically, what, what can we say about this passage? What, what truth about the institution of marriage might, might be reflected in it? Well, yes, it doesn't actually ma mention the institution of marriage. It mentions clinging to one's wife. It's presumed, I would assume. I, I, I think we might want to go that far. You're leaving your parents' place to go set up your own household. So you're, it doesn't that, really that say what you said household. Strong emphasis on, on the, structure the, the structure of the family. Structure of the family? Right. Okay. 
Um, and there's a whole sense of becoming one flesh, whatever we want to make out of that. Um, I, I think, although it's not specifically mentioned here, we could probably read between the lines and see some sense of, of the institution of marriage um, as involving procreation. We see that in the first chapter, uh, in the first creation story, uh, more strongly emphasized. Um, and in the ancient world, procreation was extremely important. Um, why would procreation have been maybe more important in the ancient world than we would think of it as being today? Well, of short life expectancies, and it was not unusual for children to die young, so it would be you want as many children to continue your, your family, continue your, your group, your tribe, your group, whatever it is, um, or they would die out, so you would want as many children as possible. So procreation was extremely important to sustain the tribe, um, it was also important to sustain inheritance rights. Um, and in the Hebrew tradition, inheritance rights uh, play a really big role. And of course, inheritance rights are um, who, who is it that inherits in the ancient Hebrew tradition? First son. First son. The firstborn son, of course. And so you have uh, the elaborate marriage which was a, a understanding of marriage that if, uh, if I were married and, and I died um, and had a brother, my brother would be obligated to uh, marry my wife and to hopefully procreate through my wife and have a male child to continue the inheritance uh, um, in, our, in that culture. So there's a lot going on here that maybe we have to read between the lines that is reflective of the ancient Hebrew understanding of marriage. And what are some other things we know about the ancient Hebrew practice of marriage? Was it one man, one woman? No. no. It, was, it was not one man, one woman, although um, especially amongst the wealthier. If you were wealthier, it was one man, many women. If you were poorer, it might be, you might be fortunate if you had one spouse. Um, what, what we also see is that uh, women uh, were understood not as loving companions to their husband, but as property. They were owned by their spouse, and uh, the spouse had uh, a lot of control over that relationship, and was the male, uh, the man was the only one who could choose to divorce. Okay, a woman could not choose to divorce. It was limited to the man who could choose to divorce and write a certificate of divorce. You can read about that in the book of Deuteronomy. <coughs> so there's a lot about marriage in the ancient Hebrew world that is maybe between the lines here. We don't know exactly how much we should read into it, but I'll leave it to, to say that there is something. Now this passage gets quoted a number of times in the New Testament. Um, Jesus quotes it in Mark chapter 2. And uh, in this context, Jesus is quoting from this passage in relationship to divorce. And uh, although Jesus' words on the surface come across as being quite harsh about divorce, they are actually um, somewhat liberating because Jesus is challenging that notion that only men can divorce their spouses, and that men have all the power in that relationship. So uh, anyone want to read this for us? <coughs> oh, sure. Linda, oh, Kelly. Oh, oh, uh, some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus is using this passage to emphasize that marriage is uh, sacred, of course, 
and that divorce is uh, not something that should be entered into lightly. Um, for many uh, millennia, well, for many centuries, the church understood this in a very black or white sort of way, that divorce was not allowed at all. And in some Christian traditions, it's still understood that way. Um, in our tradition, that is not the case. We recognize that there are legitimate times when uh, divorce is not only acceptable, but, but necessary, and the, you know, the healthiest thing for a couple. Um, I raise it here just because I want to point out again that we can't have our cake and eat it too. That if we're going to take the Genesis 2 passage and say marriage is only between a man and a woman, then we need to take every other reference to that passage and also interpret it in a literal fashion. Um, and we're not ready to do that, I don't believe. Uh, especially those of among you who may have been divorced, you probably don't want to understand this in some wooden and literal fashion. There's one other passage from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And again here, um, probably a disciple of the Apostle Paul is using uh, this passage from um, Genesis chapter 2 um, in order, in this case, to uh, emphasize that women um, should not, um, uh, should learn well. Let's read. Um, anyone? Linda. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. <clears throat> Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For, for, Adam, <laughs> for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. should not have had a woman read this passage. <laughs> it's actually very good. That's a good example. Editorial comment. <laughs> you know, so again, you know, we have a, a, a text from the Old no. Testament that is being used in the New well, Testament in a, in a in a way that we are, are are no longer willing to go with. We 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 uh, understand that you know whatever the context was for this writer to speak about. Um, <coughs> Woman's uh, yeah. learning in silence with full submission, not teaching or having authority over a man. She used to keep silent. Um, that, that in our context, um, this is no longer uh, what we would say, um, and what's the word I'm looking for, authoritative, if you would. Um, that the context is a, is a different context, and we, we would not want to. Uh, impose this on the woman of our congregation or of our denomination. And so, again, if we're going to use the text from Genesis 2 to say that marriage is only between a man and a woman, then in faithfulness we need to use these other texts in the way they were intended in their first century context. Paul? Uh, is, is that true for the worldwide Methodist Church? Because I, I understand that part of the problems with the homosexual question is that you know the African uh, conference and, and the Asian conferences see it very differently than we do. Do they see this differently too? Um, there, I'm sure is, is some um, some difference among some United Methodists and other cultures. But I know in Africa we have uh, United Methodist uh, women are. Uh, Women are ordained. As a matter of fact, uh, Liz Young's sister is a pastor in Zimbabwe, a woman pastor. Uh, we have uh, woman <coughs> bishops, a uh, woman bishop in Liberia for many years. So uh, I know that in, in the African church, uh, that is not as, as much of an issue. You know, again, can't speak across the board. But can I chime in? A yes, little bit you sure this? can. Please do. <coughs> I think that we have to be really careful when we talk about this upcoming general conference and we talk about the central conferences or the, the conferences that are outside the United States 
because very frequently it said, well, yeah, we're this way because of them. But I think the reality is that we still, as a nation, are full of Southern Baptist territory, and the Southern Baptists and anyone teaching in a Southern Baptist seminary must sign a confession saying that they uh, disagree with any kind of women's ordination. I mean, you can be a Sunday school teacher, but you, you know, it is very limited into what you can do. And so there are actually many uh, people from these central conferences who feel that this is a really racist argument. And I don't think anybody would ever intend that here, but I think we have to be really careful because there are quite a number of really powerful American Methodists that are even pushing back on women's ordination. And so um, it's, it's not just them, it's us. It's yes. us, yes. But then there are also other denominations even in this area where the women can't be elders of the church. Either. Right. But, yeah, but... So but the, in, the, in the United Methodist Church, it's, it's us. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so the other point I would make is that uh, marriage as an institution is not stagnant. It is always changing. And what we experience as the institution of marriage today is fairly new. Um, this whole notion that you marry someone you love, mm -hmm. that you have feelings for, that, that's, a, that's a new concept uh, in the history of the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. And the notion that marriage is only for the sake of procreation, um, we recognize in couples who choose not to have children uh, that that's a legitimate choice for them and that uh, not having children if they don't choose to have them it is there's nothing sinful about that there's nothing wrong about that so you know, we just have to understand that marriage as an institution is constantly changing and I believe in our time that it includes change to the reality that individuals of the same gender can marry and of course we have and Pam and Pat, a uh, wonderful example of that in our midst, and I'm grateful for that. Jerry. Yeah, even in some advanced societies today, like India and certain parts of the Middle East, arranged marriages, not forced marriage, mm -hmm. no, arranged marriages are commonplace. Yes, yes. yes. And yeah. accepted. Yeah, they're, they're, they are still commonplace and accepted, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. <laughs> have examples in our own congregation of arranged marriages that some have worked and some have not. All right, so that's as much as I wanted to say here. Unfortunately, the person who raised the question isn't here today. <laughs> oh, well. And they didn't arrange it. They didn't ask it in, uh, because they didn't necessarily. Uh... So this is really <laughs> Oh, I did want to make a point that <clears throat> The reality is the institution of marriage, as we understand it, is, is um, under great fire today. Um, I don't know about those of you who have children of marrying age. I have four of them. And uh, they have no interest in marriage. <laughs> and we have a whole generation of, of kids, uh, kids of young adults, who have very little interest in marriage. Um, part of it I can blame on my generation and uh, the ba generation of baby boomers in which 50% of all marriages ended in divorce. But uh, you know, marriage for them is, is uh, just not what it used to be. And so here now we have uh, gay members of our society who say, we want to get married. We buy into this institution. We want the protections it offers. We want that. Um, uh, acknowledgement of our, of our uh, loved ones. Um, and so in that sense, I would say gay marriage actually supports the institution of marriage, whereas often what we hear is that gay marriage will destroy the institution of marriage. I don't think that is a statement that is warranted. Um, it's uh, said for reasons I don't know. All right. So. What we primarily want to do today is uh, going to look at a panel discussion that was put together by the United Methodist Communications. And uh, each of these individuals will present a particular plan that will be going before General Conference starting on Saturday. Uh, you have in front of you a summary of three of those plans, which are the 
Um, and I'll do it in the order that you see it here. The One Church Plan, the Connection of Conference Plan, and the Traditional Plan. A fourth plan was put forward afterwards, after the uh, Commission on the Way Forward uh, had already made their decisions, but has been approved to be presented at General Conference. And it's just called the Simple Plan. So um, I think we'll listen to uh, a portion of this panel discussion, and then we'll come back to look uh, more closely at this. Um, I don't know uh, what your thoughts are on panel discussions. I find them very difficult to watch. This one goes on for about an hour and a half. <laughs> I made it through the first 40 minutes and said, that's enough. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it, it's wonderful. There's a lot of information, a lot of give and take, but it, it's just a challenging way to, uh, to learn about these things. But I think there's some value because uh, as the panel discussion begins, we'll hear a summary of each plan, and then um, the uh, presenters will be asked, what is the one thing that they think we should take away from each of those plans? And so that's as far as I want to get today. And then uh, next week, we may watch a little bit more, but we'll also watch another video that's 13 minutes long, much more, uh, much more bearable. So let's see if we can do this. <coughs> I by no means consider myself an expert on uh, the Commission on the Way Forward and on the various plans that have been put forward by the Commission on the Way Forward. Um, we have three of those on this summary sheet, and I have also sent you out a document regarding the simple plan. The simple plan is very simple. It merely says, let's remove all the language um, in the Book of Discipline regarding homosexuality, um, other than perhaps that which protects homosexuals as it, the language in the Book of Discipline protects others in our society. But all the punitive language, all of the disciplinary language, let's, let's just remove it. Let's go back to pre-1972. In the, in the document that I sent to you gives their rationale for, each, uh, for the removal of each of those statements in the Book of Discipline. Um, as Althea, um, and I really appreciate her, and, um, you know, again, she's speaking as uh, a gay a lesbian woman. She's speaking as an ordained clergy person in the United Methodist Church. She's giving voice to, uh, quite frankly, those who will either suffer greatest from whatever decisions are made or experience the greatest liberation, <laughs> uh, depending on which plan are, uh, is chosen. Um, and yet, that group did not have much representation in the Commission on the Way Forward. Virtually none. Virtually none. And you have to imagine, okay, uh, here you are, you're an ordained clergy person in a denomination that doesn't ordain gay clergy. And uh, so to step forward, to have a voice, um, it wasn't going to happen, it didn't happen. So uh, those who either were going to benefit most or suffer most had the least voice <laughs> in the conversation. And that's oftentimes the I way I just couldn't help but notice either the very white middle-aged man-ness <laughs> of yeah. the panel, yeah. just lack of any diversity really. Uh, just as an aside, when this was done live, and I watched some of it live, uh, they had Althea at the feet of, oh my oh. and it was just one of these, and sure, nobody thought about it, it was just the way it happened, wow. but I was so glad when I saw, saw it uh, not live, at, you know, the tape version, that she was <coughs> over their heads, where she wow. clearly belongs. <laughs> um, it was just one of those things. So. Can I just point out really quickly, too, in, in looking at the mechanics of this conversation, that all three of the men at the table refer to this as an issue, and Pastor Althea referred to this as human lives. 
And I think that that has been a great divide in this conversation all along, is that there are those who have the luxury of referring to this as an issue, as, oppo as opposed to referring to the fact that this is something that leads to death for some people. And that as a church, we need to make a decision about how we are either protecting lives and, and, and nurturing lives, or whether we are going to uh, proclaim a killing faith. Um, for, for the three plans that uh, came out of the Commission on the Way Forward, it's an institutional issue. It's, a, it's about the institution. Whereas for the simple plan, it's about human beings who uh, suffer uh, at the hands of the institution. <coughs> Uh, the simple plan is the only plan that would allow uh, the uh, GLBTIQ community as a whole, no matter where they are in the United Methodist Church, uh, not to experience harm. Okay, so it's the only plan that across the board allows them to uh, to be in a place where they can be honored and respected for who they are. In all of the other plans, well, the traditional plan, there's just no place, although they would not say there's no place, they, but in reality there's no place for a uh, you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender person in the United Methodist Church in terms of uh, truly being honored for who they are. Uh, the other two plans, the connectional plan and the uh, one church plan, basically say that uh, depending where you live, uh, whether it's geographical or in the case of, of the connectional plan, which of the three jurisdictions you are a part of, the traditional, the um, progressive, or the, what's the, unity. unity uh, you know, depending which of those you're a part of, based on typically where your conference chooses to land, um, you may or may not be able to be ordained. You may or may not be able to uh, uh, have your your marriage in your church and by your clergy person. So um, it, it's just you know the only plan that across the board protects um, the GBL. G yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, oh, <laughs> Yes, I do. Um, so I just want to you know, point that out. Um, I see Shirley and then Glenn. I think there's, there's more to it because I've heard people talking about it here in Florida. Uh, and I don't know where it is, but I I think the reality is that no matter which of these plans were ch is chosen, if in fact any of them are chosen, one of the things Christy and I learned yesterday from an individual who's been much more involved in this process than we have been, uh, is that it's really possible that all four of these plans would be voted down at this special session of General Conference, which would leave us basically back to where we are today with the Book of Discipline as it reads today. And uh, for, you know, should that happen, then uh, there would be a lot of churches, there would be a lot of individuals who would have to make decisions about whether they could continue to live under this umbrella of the United Methodist Church. Jerry? I, I, it's, I just thought of it, and it just seems to me that if you look at societal trends over the past 30 years, <coughs> it's been just Power has been distributed, not centralized. Whether it's communications and, and the demise of the Soviet Union and, and all that, power has been sent out to the people to a much greater degree today than it was 20, 30 years ago. And so that might have something to do uh, with what ends up ha happening here, just part of that societal trend going away from centralized power and more toward power to the people, power to the individual. Uh, and and you, you're probably right in your assessment. And I think uh, the traditional folks actually have been the folks who have, over the course of uh, uh, many years, 
been the ones who have really wanted to see uh, annual conferences and local churches have more power because um, that, that's very important to them. It's called accepting differences. Yeah. <laughs> well, not accepting differences. But <coughs> clam. Yeah. Wish it was. So who gets to vote on each one of those plans? Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about this last week. So oh, general conference consists of a set number of delegates uh, from all of the annual conferences. And uh, annual conferences are, are geographical conferences. And there's what Christy referred to earlier as the central conferences, which are the non-United States conferences, uh, Africa, Europe, Russia, um, Philippines. Uh, so you've got delegates who are elected by each of their conferences. Um, and so those are the individuals who will go to the special session of conference and will have a, a vote. There'll be many other people there. This person we were talking to yesterday is going to be there uh, to have couch conversations. As a gay man, he uh, and others will, will be there just inviting the delegates to sit down with us, have some conversation with us, uh, have some you know, informal basis. Before you go and vote, you know, just sit down and have some conversation. So there'll be a lot of folks there as guests who have no vote, but will nonetheless, their presence will be uh, important. Um, and the delegates will be clergy and laity. Right. So okay. it's not just pastors. Always, yeah. always an equal number of clergy and laity, and that is true. Yeah. And every vote that is taken in the United Methodist Church at whatever level, it's always an equal number. Andrea, and then Pam. Um, I still have a lot to learn about the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> but we, we do, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it seems to me just, I don't know, as humans, just because something's written doesn't mean that that's how we feel, right? So no matter which plan is voted on, if, like you said, any of them at all, because I know my home church denomination has been arguing about this for years as well and never comes to a conclusion. Um, and so I think that, you know, no matter which plan is put into place, the churches that are welcoming are still going to be welcoming. You're still going to feel loved by them. I hope you guys feel loved by us. Um, just because it's written certain ways in the Book of Discipline doesn't mean that that's how our hearts feel. Um, but then also, reverse, if the simple plan is what goes into effect, churches that are not welcoming are still, those people are not going to be welcoming. It's a it's a person thing, like like Althea was saying, It's it's about human beings. The, and then like the, the people are the ones who are going to create that welcoming environment um, just because you are able to now pastor a church or officiate a wedding doesn't mean that if you don't want to, you're going to, or if a church doesn't want you, you're not going to be welcomed. And I think that's a really hard part about church is the institutional aspect of it. Um, just because it's written doesn't mean that that's what I want to do or what I want to feel, but I can't imagine leaving this church community, the community that we've built, you know? So, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, it depends on how we come at it. You know, if we come at it purely from a perspective of social justice, for, for me, it's, it's cut and dry from a perspective of social justice. We don't want to discriminate against anyone. Um, both we come at it from an ecclesiastical perspective, and what is the church, and um, being the diverse church that we are. Uh, we were talking a lot yesterday, you know, this congregation is such a diverse congregation, and Christy and I value all of that diversity, even when you disagree with us. Um, <laughs> it's part of what makes this congregation such a, a beautiful place. Um, but at the same time, it can be challenging as well. Pam, and then Sherry. Well, I just want, I don't think I'd read anywhere what the difference between the traditional plan and the modified <coughs> traditional are. Is it just something small? That's 
The original traditional plan was mostly declared unconstitutional, like <coughs> enormous pieces of it were unconstitutional, and so I think they came forward with the second one. But I'm not sure. So what, what we're difference. reading here is might be the modified. I I think so, but I'm not. I don't remember what has been changed. So uh, and we'll talk. We're, we're way beyond time. We'll talk a lot more about all of these next week. But one of the big issues uh, for any of these plans is what happens to those congregations who just can't live with that particular plan if it's voted in? Is there a gracious exit for that? So the modified uh, traditional plan, which uh, uh, I'll just read what's here. A petition, a petition submitted by Maxie Dunham, a very common name in the Methodist Church, augments the gracious accountability section of the traditional plan by adding a $200,000 grant to annual conferences leaving the denomination to help pay for transitional expenses. Um, stipulates that the bishops who do not commit to uphold the discipline's prohibitions will no longer receive funding for housing, office, or travel, will instead be encouraged to join a self-governing church. So it's all about that exit. How, how do we make it possible for churches and annual conferences to exit, in the case of the traditional plan, that what they would consider to be the one and only United Methodist Church. We'll talk more about that next week, and we'll talk about all these plans, and I'll show you a 13-minute video that I just watched for the first time last night, and it was delightful. It's the one that will recommend it to us. Uh, uh, kind of helps put things in perspective. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we enter into this week in the life of the United Methodist Church, that will provide both uh, challenges and opportunities. We pray that your spirit would be moving in ways that perhaps none of us could even imagine at this moment. Ways that will truly allow us to be the Church of Jesus Christ in our uh, world in a way that bears witness to your love and bears witness to the diversity of your creation. We commit to you all of those delegates who will be coming together, bishops who will continue to provide leadership for all those guests who will be providing a witness in their own way. And we ask that through them all, something wonderful and unexpected would happen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Real quickly, um, if anybody's interested, the prodigals will be